Hey. Are we there? It is 7 p.m. We ready, Dale? Ready. All right. There we go. Now it's going. Can you stop sharing? We're starting. We're starting the meeting right now. We're ready to go. All right. We're good. Ready to go for our, our eight o'clock. All right. Welcome everyone to this meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society. I am Bob Trimbley, the president. Um, this is our new meeting time, 7 p.m., and I, I think everybody's been pretty pleased with it. Um, we had a Perseids party at uh, uh, the uh, both Stony Creek and our Stargate Observatory, and I was at the Stony Creek event, and we had several people there. We had a couple telescopes, and my wife and I set up my meteorites, and we had a lot of people. Dave, Bob, Ber Bob Berta gave a presentation, so did I, and that was pretty good. Uh, Jeff McLeod set up his Mercury simulator, which Gemini, Gemini simulator, sorry. And how many did you run through eventually? 22 crews. 22 crews. Wow. So if you haven't seen that thing, it is fantastic. We have an uh, event coming up at Kensington Metro Park on the 29th. Um, I may have gotten a volunteer for that. I'm not sure. I think there was some confusion with the uh, August 12th event at Sunny Creek. So I will send out another email to the membership. They just want a telescope or two and somebody to give a sky tour. No biggie. Um, the annual awards banquet is going to be at the Ukrainian Cultural Center Monday, December 11th from 6 to 11 p.m. Thanks a lot to Mark Kedzier for organizing all that. Yay! Can you give him a round of applause. Thank you. And our speaker is going to be John Blum, and thanks to Dale Parton for organizing that. I actually like to talk about that. I, I can't I can't wait to hear him talk. So that's pretty cool. So our next open house and star party is at Stargate Observatory, Saturday, August 26th. Be there at dark 30. So do we have any first timers here tonight? We do. We have some first timers. How did you hear about us? I I I I email. You do? Yes. Oh, you're the folks that brought the telescope to the yeah, event. Yeah. Thank you very much. How many folks did you have look through it? Oh, I don't know. Lot. She said a whole lot. Yay, yeah, outreach. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. So, uh, Adrian is not here, so you're not going to renew your membership or, or sign up the, with him, but you can do it via PayPal online. Um, we are accepting submissions for our 2024 astrophoto calendar. So, if you have a photo, it doesn't need to be astrophoto, it's astronomy related or something cool, send it to publications at warrenastro.org. And uh, when, when do we, yeah, there you go. When do we, uh, when was the deadline on that, Dale? August 31st. Okay, so the end of this month. So get those, yep. get those pictures in. Officers reports. Uh, mine, I don't have much here. I, I mentioned last time I'm giving a presentation on exoplanets at the Detroit Public Library on the 29th at 6 p.m. Um, I'm, I've been doing a lot of research on that, and I just I just can't believe every day I see a new post about some exoplanet discovery, and it goes to the bottom of my lecture, and uh, I'm sorting them for, as they go. So Dale Parton, our first P BP, uh, he, he you want you want to do this? Okay, here he is. Um, there is Dale. Okay, hello everyone. Um, we are always looking for more people to give presentations. Frankly, <clears throat> we're booked up this year, but I'm <clears throat> working hard on getting speakers for early next year. Uh, if you've got something, let me know. It can be either a full length presentation or a short one, okay? Be happy to entertain new people giving presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. So, uh, Jeff McLeod, you got anything anything to report on the observatory? No, I'm at 26. 26. Okay, so yeah, nothing, nothing to do there. For... Our treasurer is not here, but he would report that we have around 30k still ish in the bank, and we we, we did just recently buy a whole bunch of new equipment, didn't we, for the observatory? Uh, we bought a whole bunch of lots here for astronomy at the beach and other events. So we've got two. Uh, vertical pull-out banners that look awesome. I think I could get them. They look, look awesome. Uh, two table runners with our logo. Uh, we ordered 250 trifolds. 
Nice. If, if, you, if you can't hear our, our first, our, uh, our second VP here is talking about all the things that he ordered for our presentation, uh, table runners, uh, trifles, uh, banner holders and stuff. Well, that'd be very cool. Okay, uh, Secretary Mark Kedzier, uh, anything, anything to, to add other than the minutes are in the WASP? Uh, the banquet. Monday, December 11th, and Adrian's report said we had about 27,000 in our trip. 27,000. So I just want to get that for the record. But okay. Okay. Uh, publications. Uh, Dale, anything to add other than your outstanding newsletter is online and ready for you to read right now at our website? Well, you covered everything already, so right. nothing to add. Kevin, uh, any outreach uh, reports? Is Kevin here? Kevin Allen? All right, so no. All right. So uh astronomy in the news. Uh I got this, like I, I put this in my uh my notes here just before I came here. I saw this on spaceweather.com. Hyperbolic comet, and I'm gonna murder this name, Nishimura. A new comet is falling into the solar system and it may become a naked eye object next month. It will be. It will be. Ooh. Discovered only days ago by an amateur astronomer in Japan, C-2023 P1 is on a hyperbolic orbit from deep space. It hasn't been here before and won't be here again. Um, this one should brighten dramatically or fall apart and fizzle. Uh, comets are, are notoriously unpredictable, but possible naked eye comet next month. Keep your eyes open. Third magnitude. Third magnitude, Ken says. That's. Do you have any other new in the news, Ken? Any other that's stuff? The one that's really the big yeah, that's. It, I saw that. It, it, it probably be better visible in um, uh, before it reaches peak of brightness because it's, it's going to be more distant to the kind of sun. But about a week before, uh, it will be uh, a little bit different time. Well, I said I, uh, so I just found out about this before the meeting. So I'll, I'll probably be doing a post on the VO about this, and I'll post something on on, on the Warren Astronomical Society site about it. But I, I at during the break, I think I'm going to look this sucker up and and show its orbit on the, the JPL small body database browser so people can see. What what you got? Ken Hansen, come on up here. Come on up here. Ken has one more in the news. Um, it's the Congress, the Congress is now um, examining the UFOs. If you want to find a bigger waste of money by any organization, they're spending about two hundred and fifty billion dollars on this particular study on UFOs. Yeah, and it's a and the interesting thing about it, it's a bipartisan thing. Which means they're all crazy. All right. I don't care where you stand. All right. If we find out that the UFOs are genuine, what are we going to do? Is what I'm saying. Gargantuan waste of money, gargantuan waste of time. And so far down the list of important things to deal with, that's your Congress right now. UFOs. That's it. So that's our astronomy news today. Oh boy. So special interest news is David Levy online. No, he's not. Ooh, David Levy is not here. I'm gonna have to find out why he's not here. So uh, I am going to share some solar images here because the sun is very active right now. Let's see. Uh, zoom. Share screen and share that. You guys see the sun? There we go. So that is the sun is. probably 15 minutes ago. A lot of sunspots, as you can see. And let's go check and see how the how, how this guy is doing. This is a 48-hour video. This is the sun for the last 48 hours. You can play now. First you need your there we go. Of the plot. So lots of flares going on. You know, Ken Burton says here, the Perseus meteor shower was a flop. My wife and I actually saw one flash in the sky on the way out of the park. And that's the only one we saw. Cheryl and I saw a whole bunch of 
Perseid meteors. You did? How many? We saw eight in a two-minute oh. period. Um, hmm. We were at Stargate. That's my fault. With, with Riyadh. And another thing that we saw while we were out there was um, Starlink. Starlink. We saw about, I don't know, two dozen satellites being launched in this very long stream of uh, Starlink. Yeah, somebody objects. mentioned they saw that, saw at, that. Uh, at, at the Perseus thing at uh, Stony Creek. I don't have the right audio selected. I will, I will, I will fix that. Okay. Okay. So the Perseids were a flop for some people, and not a flop for some people. Well, I'm saying they wouldn't even up to the amount that they should. They have. should have about twelve or fifteen over a period. That was, was not bad. But uh, yeah, I, I was, I, I, I had the ubiquitous. Oh, did you see that? No, I didn't. So sixteen hours they should. I, I did have that happen. Um, all right. So, do we have any astronomy questions? Is anybody in the audience? Anything else? Okay. No. What do you got? These uh, comets don't come from the solar system. Where are they coming? They are coming they from. The the okay. The question here from the audience was: These comets that don't come from the solar system, where do they come from? And the answer is, they come from another solar system. They are probably ejected uh, by by close encounters with stars or planets, um, or 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 uh, you know, our sun going through somebody else's Oort cloud or whatever. They, they they come from out system. Heaven only knows where they came from. Um, so I just found out about this afternoon. I haven't seen anybody try to trace it back to where it came from. I'm sure you'll see that in the next couple of days. But. <clears throat> Yes, what do you got? Besides the Perseids, are there any other meteor showers? Besides the Perseids, are there any other meteor showers? Lots and lots. And I will, I, I gave a presentation on that. Two major ones. All right. I, I can send you a link. Well, three. The Perseids are the largest. You can go to let's go to the, the question was we're talking about meteor showers here. Um, you can go to amsmeteors.org. I'm gonna go there right now and share it. That is uh, a site I go to for meteor showers. That's the American Meteor Society, amsmeteors.org. I will share that link in chat. If I can find the chat. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there a, is amsmeteors.org. Did you get one of All right. I'm going to share this screen. All right, there's the American Meteor Society, and it has a whole bunch of things on there. Like, there's the shower list. Is that on the screen there? Yeah. So, there on the screen. Okay, on the screen there, this is the American Meteor Society. This shows the major showers. There's a whole bunch of yeah. minor showers. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, there, there's a pretty cool site, which I, I'll show later on during the break, that shows where the meteors come from. It, it's really cool. So you know, when, when, when uh, you know, you've, you've seen pictures of comets, right? And the, the pretty huge tails and stuff like that. Well, all that those tails are, are, are dust and gas coming off the comet. Well, that stuff just doesn't go away. It continues on in the same orbit that comet was in. It spreads out a little bit, but so it comes around in that same orbit and the, the, the close point to the sun of the orbit of many of these comets is right by the earth. And so that stream follows that orbit. And every year the earth plows through that. It's like, oh, there's these rivers of particles in the solar system, many, many of them. And again, I, I got a picture that'll, that'll show that very well. So anyway, uh, so observing reports. Do we have any observing reports from people? Yes, we have several. Jeff, come on up. Oh, I saw a lot of people at uh, <laughs> Up here. Oh, yeah. 
Well, our audience would like people in the box. <laughs> okay. Uh, I saw people out of Stony Creek. That was cool. Uh, then I got talked into going to Stargate after that closed. Seriously? Yeah, drove the spaceship all the way there. Uh, walked around, talked to some people, and then decided, all right, I'm going to lay on the roof of the observatory until I see 10. So I laid on the observatory for about 40 minutes, finally saw 10, got to come back down and go home. Uh, but the other reason that I rose my hand is I want to proselytize for astronomy at the beach real quick. So September uh, 22nd, 23rd, this is the big one, people. If you don't want to help, at least go. Uh, it's at Island Lake State Rec Area in the Brighton region. I think it's same actually in Brighton. Uh, same place it's been the last several years. Yes. Uh, we are going to try to be there in force. So if you'd like to help us out, we need people sitting at our lost table telling people about our club. We, gonna take the big we're going to take the big job. Mm -hmm. I need people to help me run it. Uh, I, I've got transport, I got assembly, I have a few people, but it's a lot easier when we have three or four people to run that scope than making one person uh, walk up and down that ladder all night. I know I've done it and been wrecked. Uh, it's a super fun scope to run. Or bring your own scope on behalf of the club. We'd love to have you. Or just bring people, tell everyone. This is this is kind of, this is our Super Bowl people. This is our let's, website. Let's this, is hit the, it. this is the website for right. Astronomy of the Beach. If you search Astronomy of the Beach 2023, you'll find it, or you can, you know, I'll, I'll put the link here in the chat. But we're stressing the solar eclipse this year, and our guests are Jesse Mason and Paul Gross. So be there or be square. It's a great event. Thank you, Jeff, for bringing that up. I, I, I should have brought that up earlier. Okay, so uh, do we have uh, any other observing reports? No, those are reports. All right. So at this point, we can take a snack break. Oh, that was really early. Since we're breaking, I will say, I got, I got some of the people on. Oh, we're saving. Uh, if you didn't, if you didn't come out really late uh, on the twelfth for the Perseids, you kind of missed out. Uh, Riyadh, we put the final viewers on that scope, and we were looking at Saturn. And Jupiter, ooh la la! I mean, yes, so good, yeah. wow. so good. Um, it actually turned out to be a really nice night. Uh, despite if you just kind of switched gears and said, "Okay, screw looking for meteorites, uh, let's just do some normal astronomy," it was uh, pretty darn good. Saturn is flattening out, so those rings are getting thinner. If you've not seen Saturn, I I've, I've been lazy. I haven't seen Saturn in a while. It's like noticeably flatter than the last time I remember seeing it and it's getting flatter so another yeah, yeah no, no, another like what two three years I mean they'll they'll just be a line yeah and they'll disappear and then it'll be three four years before they really start coming back yeah. so get your Saturn observations in don't they don't they call that equinox on, on Saturn uh, yeah I mean it, I know because Cassini took some amazing pictures of yeah. things in the ring when the rings were edge on like that and like so that's actually Saturn's equinox what we're seeing is when it's lined up with us which is slightly different yeah I would like to give my kudos to Riyadh he does a wonderful job out there. He showed us a bunch of things with the scope when we were out there for the Perseids. And he had a bunch of Girl Scouts out there and was showing them a bunch of stuff. Nice. And he uh, also put the, uh, the spectrum uh, thing on for, uh, for one of the stars. And it was wonderful. He, he is uh, deserving of a lot of praise. Okay. Uh, what well, what he was saying is he was he wanted uh, Alan was saying he wanted to give kudos to Riyadh for how how wonderful he is working at the observatory with all the students and, and scouts and everyone. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. Now thank I'm you. Uh, actually, we had a really good night. Uh, oh. To be honest with you, it, um, the uh, the meteor shower uh, got better and better as the night uh, progressed. So um, I I was there until I closed at about uh, three fifteen a.m. And um, after the last uh, person left at about um, maybe 2.30 or so. Um, so it was really a great night, to be honest with you. And I, 
we had something like about 50 to 60 people that came out, including the scouts. And uh, yeah, it was a really good night. So hopefully we'll uh, we'll do the same um, uh, in terms of observing. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, good work. Um, maybe we'll see everybody at the next open house. Thank you. All right. So we are taking a snack break. Riyad, could you do me a favor? Just keep talking for a second. I'm trying to get the microphone working through this HDMI here. So. I'm okay. <laughs> microphones. Right. Well, a couple of things that um, we're uh, looking at right now, as Alan mentioned, is uh, we got the uh, spectroscope filter out uh, to start experimenting with it. And I already took a couple of pictures. Of course, with the phone, it just barely kind of gives us an idea of what to expect. Uh, we're going to need a camera, as we talked about before, and that should be coming up next. All right. Thanks, Riyad. Well, yeah, can we? We're going to be, we're going to be swapping my PC out for the 12 PC here. Hopefully, we can get the audio projecting inside here. I've got way too many microphone objects competing with each other here. Riyadh, what filter are you using to keep the spectroscope? Yeah, I think I heard a question about which filter we're using. Um, this is the uh, spectroscopic um, uh, filter that we purchased, that I purchased um, a few months ago. Um, and uh, basically it uh, it acts as a, as a spectroscope and then you can take images uh, of uh, the spectra of the star. And we also purchased, um, I purchased a um, software that will analyze it, um, analyze the, uh, the spectrum. So uh, you end up with uh, the ability to be able to actually look at these stars, uh, image them and analyze their spectra. So that's something that should, should be of a lot of interest to a number of people. Um, and you can see where it, get a taste of what it's like to, do real astronomy and um, which is a could be a lot of fun. What wavelengths are you filtering for? Uh, the spectra looks at uh, the entire uh, optical spectrum. Actually, it goes uh, from uh, from as deep a red as it as you can see all the way into uh, the beginning of the ultraviolet. So whatever your camera uh, is able to see. Uh, you'll be able to um, uh, image that.
shared on my screen. That's what I thought. We're like, how is my screen still shared? I turned my computer on. Can someone say something? Something. Does that work? Can you hear me? Oh, I just heard it through there. Through there? I just heard it through there, there. yep. We have to test it. I, I didn't hear anyone. Can we share it right now yet or not? We're testing the sound. Okay. If it's good. Hello, hello. Yeah, we hear you. Thank you. This works. Yay. Okay, you can share it. You want to share the whole The whole thing. Open it up. I got, a, I got an idea about okay. that. Let's open it up. Okay, let me do this. Um, it's not working, that mouse. Oh, that's right. It's still not working. I don't know why I didn't bring my other. Um, what I'm going to do is I want to say, I want to go back. Um, Hit stop share with the mouse. And what I'm thinking about doing here is... Um, uh, one way is to have two, uh, two presentations on your laptop, yeah. one of them, and use the other one for presentation. That's for what your I'm thinking. Own. Let me do this. Okay. Let's do this. Um, come on, open up. Double click. Why is it not coming up? Oh, there it is. Okay. Why is it not showing? The presentation itself. Why is it not doing it? Can we close it and reopen? I, I, I'm trying to figure out at the top, but why is it not showing the, the at anything right now? No, I think just go ahead and quit keynote. Okay. Quit it and again, yeah. do it again? Yeah. Okay. Because it, it did try to open and it was in the presentation. Mode. Okay, there it is. So what I want to do is... Quick, because I got to okay, figure this out. Okay, let's do this first. <laughs> okay. okay, so... Can we see your name? Only your name. I got gotcha. you. I'm working on it. Play. And it's just not doing it. It just won't show it. Come on, you stupid okay. thing. Stop. Maybe go to slide. I don't want that. We didn't see it before. We saw your presentation stuff before. Alan, I got it. I don't know why it's not doing that, and it should be doing that. This is killing me. Uh, go to slide. Go to slide and click on go to. Are you looking? It just says next slide and last slide. But I don't want that. I want that. I want the. Okay, let's try hitting escape. What? Just hit escape and see if it does. Okay. Let's just. Let's see. Um, view. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, Comments is supposed to show here. Oh, uh, there we go. That's what I want. Okay. And then, if you want to play, you can play. Or if you want. Yes, I can. Uh, but you have to share your screen. That's all right. I don't care. That's fine. No, you have to share the screen. I get it. I just want to see it work. Oh, okay. Okay. That's what I wanted to do first. Okay. So, but it's not doing it now. 
It's not doing what I want it to do. There it is. That's what I want. Okay, so now we're going to share the screen. And I want to get back to the original. I want to go back. 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 It won't do it. Go back to view. View at the... No, with the mouse. Oh. Come on up here. Navigator. Go to the first slide. Or whatever slide you want. Okay. That's what we're going to have to do. Right? Yeah. Presentation type. You want it self playing or? I'll, I'll play it. I'll, okay. I'll push it. Okay. I think it's all good. Just That's the one, the bottom one, right? Yeah. I'm sharing the whole whole desktop. Okay. There we go. We're on the screen. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Do you want me to move this out of your way? Yeah, we're we're are we shared now? Yes, we are. Okay, yeah, let's. Okay, um, we're shared. Just, just pull this up to the bottom. Do it. That's what I want. Perfect. You can put it up top if you, you want. want it uh, That's good. Okay, so I know I can. Can they see it? Is what we want to know. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Again, we can see it pretty good. We see your presenter screen. You're good. You got it? We see your presenter screen with all of what That's what we want to do. We're fine. We're having difficulty with another aspect of it, but this will be fine. Thank you for your input, Alan. <laughs> No, 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 and I'm just wondering why this sucker won't work. Battery? No, the battery's fine. It's when I get it away from the system, somehow it stops working. I gotta reconnect the Bluetooth? They won't do it. And I should have brought the the other one. I didn't do it. You want to borrow mine? I got, I got one you borrow. Do you have one that we can plug in? Oh, you're you're the you're a champion. However, it's got a slit in there. Flat. And this is for the power. Let me see if I. No, it won't go. There we go. We're good. Okay, we'll just do it that way. How about that? You saved my life on this one. Okay. I'm now ask away. History of the telescope. All right, Galileo. What was the year that he? Saw Six, sixteen ten. Sixteen ten. At sixteen oh nine, he had okay. one. He built one. How, when was when was the first time spy glasses were used? For they were photos? before that. Uh -huh. Okay. So what we're talking about? You have to understand something about the telescope. He was an optician, you know your body, all right? And he noticed when he put the two lenses together that he, the church across the way blew up. His kids used to play with it and everything like that. He built them too. This was on flipper shit. Okay, flipper shit. Yeah, it's got into the reports. It got, it got uh, the Congress and I guess it was, uh, I guess it was Denmark, one of the Scandinavian countries. It's in here somewhere. Anyway, and Hans Lippershey wanted to qualify it for the uh, country. He couldn't get it approved until he said, well, you can see um, enemy ships on the horizon and you can prepare for them. Oh, they went. That's a great idea. 
So they qualified it as a discovery or whatever they did that what it was something. So that's what that's what happened initially, right away. It's said, and you'll hear this in the presentation, that way back we think that maybe they had something like that. So we'll see. We don't know yet. What 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 I'm wondering about is if there were any notes from the logs of the ships, the people that used those, that said, hey, I looked at the moon today through this thing, and it was really cool. Yeah, well, you didn't get that until... I know, well, but would that be in the logs? And if so, that's certainly not digitized. You're going to have to go through those logs for all those ships. You would have Where to Where would those be? It might be there. We don't know. Would those be, would those be in an archive somewhere? I, I have no idea. This that, that's going to be one hell of a research project. So we are ready to go with this whenever you're ready to go. I guess we're about ready. Well, you're not doing it till 8, right? Starting at 8? Because I told my friends, 8 coming at 8. So. I, I also posted 8, so we probably shouldn't start until 8. But uh, we can share some stuff until then. I'm wondering if I'm I can... sharing your presentation. Yeah. Um... I'm wondering if we go down here, that will work. Yeah, it will. That's what I want. Okay, we're good. I love it. Looks like we're going to go. Get it. Is that a tell? Is that an, an, a, a computer or is it a viewfinder? That's a computer. It has the CPU down there. We don't have that paper. I tried to. Maybe it will work. I, I, I'm not sure. That might do it. Or maybe not. What do you need? I'm, I'm trying to connect the monitor to this laptop. But it's a com it's a computer set up with CPU and all. Right? Yeah, I don't think we can. No. Maybe. No. Uh -oh. I can tell you that right now. No. I think it was about we need the HPM. Let me see. You got it. I don't think it's here. No. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, that's the HPM. Yeah, that's the HPM. Yeah, that's the Let's give it a shot. Yeah, it's the same. It should be. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same. I 
I saw a flash. Oh, okay. Is it showing up? It did for a second. Did it, did it start? What's it doing? Oh. Power loose. There it is. The power was loose. Good. What do you got? Well, I got the power light anyway. But there you go. Okay. Um, if that bothers your status, uh, signal not found. Check the video cable. Do we, do we, wait, we're not plugged. Are we plugged into here? We are. You are. What? You have to extend or duplicate your display. I can't hear you. You said, do you have to extend or duplicate the display now? I don't know. I don't think it's going to do it. It's a good try, though. Good try. I wonder if... What was the thing you used... I got time. What was the thing you used to, to, uh, to look to see if I was on it? What was the thing that showed the two screens that they showed? It may show a third one. The one that showed which one you choose to show. Oh, uh, like the come? share or? No, there was this one that showed the screens. Oh, and we yeah, picked the, one. The share yeah, that's, what, that's, what that, that's the extend or, or uh, expand. This one, right? Yeah. There might be another one here. No, it's, I don't think it's working. Okay, all right. All right, well, okay. So we're back here with this one. Okay. I have the Tome of All Knowledge. Come on. Here we go. Are we on? Yeah, how do you extend okay. the display? On? We're good. We're good. Oh, you do? Yeah. Not as good as I want. That's right. It's not going to be on there. Forget it. We don't even have to think about it. Forget it. It's not going to do it. That's okay. We're good. We'll be fine. Wow. Hey, Ken. Hey, Laura. Laura. This is the site I wanted to show you. This is meteorshowers.org. And what this does is this shows the stream of particles. That's the orbit of the comet where they came from. Brilliant. Uh, I can't believe you could find all this stuff. This is uh, well, a presentation with this live one. But there's the orbit of the Earth right there. And you can see it, it plows right through that stream. Wow. Now, I believe from what I've heard that every 11 years or so, those particles wow. are really, really dense Ella. when it goes through. But okay. they, they all look like this. But it's just, that's the leftover comet particles. It's so then beautiful. And that cool and there's what you can see As, are they there are all the time uh, everything at once all, the all of them all at once oh my yes god you never seen yes nobody's ever showed this on tv or anywhere That's like, before you joined up i gave a presentation oh. called rivers in the sky what, like six years ago probably oh man do it again 
Yeah, you should. Sure. But yeah, that, that's all. I mean, you can pick whatever comment. Oh, whatever, that is amazing. The next one is coming up. I want to take a picture with my phone of it. This is all the comets. This is all the particle streams from the comets that cause meteor shower. Meteor showers dot org. Wait, I show this to my sister and brother. I'll put this in chat too. You know, you're not going to get that. Um, and our solar system is right, right there. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's the orbit of uh, what is that? It's probably the orbit of the we're right there, right? Yeah, we're in the middle there. Okay, yeah. Well, you really get to see a lot, don't you? Be a part of that Italian. Uh, uh, I had. Um, I actually forgot to tell about this. Have you ever seen um, a documentary called Star Men? It was about four fairly old astronomers. Yeah, I haven't heard of it either. Um, only one of them, only one of those astronomers is still alive. He emailed Brother Guy uh, last week with a story he wanted posted because the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, which I help support, uh, is celebrating its 30th anniversary and he wanted a post about what is advanced in it. And he posted that. He sent, he sent Brother Guy the text. Brother Guy sent it to me. And I do this a lot. I, I take the text, I, uh, re I reformat it, I add some relevant pictures, and I add it in about the author at the bottom. And I went and I found a YouTube podcast interview with him, and I included Man, that on the bottom. History he, all together for the rest of us. Wrote Brother guy, brother guy wrote me back. He said, "Here's some fan mail for you." And I'm like, "What?" This guy wrote back and said, "I want to, I want to compliment the person or persons that created that post." And I'm like, "Oh my God!" Oh, that's good. That made me, that was like, no, you know, excellent. I mean, I mean, where else would I ever see that unless you had done that? All right, you convinced me. I got, I got to give that, I got to give that presentation again. This is a short one, anyway. You ever seen this? This is meteorshowers.org. This is this is the streams of particles. That, that's showing all of them. It's a little bit a lot to take in, but you know, that is the comet's orbit, and that is the particle stream that we go through. We just lost audio. Seven minute warning.
By the way, that's wrong again. What? what? I, I, I've changed the whole thing, but it's not, this is not part one anymore. I can do this right now. You have five minutes to kick that out. I'm just going to take it out. That's good. <laughs> Gone. It's no longer part one. This is not a two part presentation. there was a victory station by somebody at the observatory in California. I watched that on YouTube because I was away. Just the whole last the guy was British, I'm so glad. He used a couple of British as a <laughs> that was pretty easy, wasn't it? <laughs> I changed it the way I like it. I changed it the way I like it. Okay. Your city was activated. And of course. On the left. Oh, it's working some newfangled technology or uh, old fangled
Yeah. Hi there. Good. How are you? Oh no! What did the doctor say? Okay, one minute warning. Get your drinks and get ready. We're going to be starting up in just a second here. <laughs> can I stop sharing this? Is that going to be a problem? If I, if I do, you want to, can I stop sharing it and, and, and use this to, to do the announcement? Or? What do you want to do? Uh, I'm sorry. You're sharing right now, and I want to have my face on here. And I say hi, welcome back. And well, you can just do it over there. And okay, I can. What I can yeah, do is I can fine. take and not share. I'm going to stop sharing. Is that okay? Okay, good. Right. Right. There you go. And then I'll come back on when you let me. Okay. You don't need me. Go to your. He needs to get back to himself. I am back, I am back to myself. You're not there. This is up there. That's what they're seeing. I just. All right. But it's not up there. That's what where it's supposed to be, right? Oh, that's not on the. I do. I gotta do it on yours. What's that? I have to do it on yours on Zoom because. Okay. Because of the HDMI connection. Well, you, you, you do that. I don't want to do that. We can shut it down or do no, whatever you want. Tab over to. Uh, mm -hmm. There you go. All right. You just want to talk. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I just start the reading. There All right. You go. You're up. Oops. All right, everyone. We're gonna start here now. Uh, Dale. Okay, hi everyone, welcome back. Station identification, this is the meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society and this is our feature presentation. And here is our first vice president to introduce our, our speaker. Thank you, Bob. Um, I feel a little bit redundant doing this tonight in the sense that anybody who's been in this club for a while knows the speaker has heard him give presentations. Uh, Ken Burton has been into astronomy for close to 70 years. He's held offices in this club, including president. Uh, he's received awards uh, from this club, the Searle Award and a lifetime membership in the organization. He uh, has been to dozens of eclipses of the moon or the sun. Uh, and he's given many, 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 many presentations uh, to this organization, as well as to other astronomy clubs and local libraries and so forth. So he's been around the block a few times. 
Um, his topic tonight, the history of the telescope. Um, thank you very much. Uh, What's that? They can't hear you, so talking talk through the laptop. To the laptop. Yeah. Can you hear me now, everyone? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy. I'm so, <laughs> what do we got? Your head's getting cut off. Let's oh. let's do this until oh. it backs on. Okay, and then okay, so you can be seen. Ah, okay. All right, but I'm going to take this thing here. I'm going to move it over. We don't have to look at it over there. Perfect. I love it. Okay, well, as um, it's been said, I've been doing this for, seems like forever. I love astronomy, obviously. I always tell people I can answer any question about astronomy you ask, not necessarily right, but most people aren't going to know the difference anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> um, the, uh, the telescope, of course, <clears throat> is, uh, is what really kick the uh, hobby of astronomy and the science of astronomy in the butt is what it did. It made it, it made it really for them, for everyone. Um, the, uh, you know, I talk to people sometimes that are believers in astrology, for example, and, and I've also told them that astrology is important because the monarchs used to pay the astrologists to predict things and the money that they paid them, they used for building telescopes and all the other things. So um, I, I don't have a great deal of dislike for astrology. I don't like it as a, thinking it's a, a science or anything. But anyway, let's go through the history of the of the telescope. And I'm, I'm gonna ask not to be asked any questions during it. This is a long presentation and we may have to split it. It's a possibility because I've added a whole bunch of stuff because it happens all the time. Something else is put up into space. Something else happens and uh, I've added to this, and I'm going to do this as quickly as I can possibly do it. And uh, and then afterward, we'll go through any questions that you have. All right, uh, let's go. I got to do this. Okay. All right. So first of all, presentations about optical telescopes, first point. Then it moves into some of the other types of telescopes, like uh, radio telescopes and the like. You're not going to do that, are you? There we go. Okay, so uh, you can see several of the different types of telescopes through the years that are listed there. You can see obviously on the bottom right uh, of the screen is the James Webb, and bottom left of the scene is the Hubble. Those are very large telescopes used in space to see things better than we could ever see it on the Earth. Ah, it worked. Well, you got to go back a long, long time. You got Claudius Ptolemy in uh, CE 90, and then uh, he lived from C, uh, uh, CE 90 to CE uh, 168. You had Ibn Saul. You know something? We're not getting uh, the writing on this one here again. Do you have any idea why? We're not seeing the on the bottom. It should be. Well, let's see what we do here. You can see some writings from the past about, it's not showing that what I needed to show. I want the I want in presenter view and it's not doing it. It's what I, that's, this is what I wanted. And I don't know why it's not doing that now. You just have to manually scroll. That's what I'm going to do. Get. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Let's go back here. Uh, optics go back before recorded history. Simple lenses made from rock crystal have been found in the early human digs. The second century CE e. Ptolemy actually wrote a thesis on optics. In that thesis, he wrote about the properties of life, when, which included reflection, refraction, and color. The Persian scholar Ibn Saul uh, who lived in the 10th century, um, uh, he it made refined uh, 
and made def uh, def refined descriptions about optics. And the, by the 12th century in Europe, reading stones, actually magnifying lenses, were in general use. Lenses used as burning glass uh, or doc black glasses are documented during that time. By the late, uh, by late in the 13th century and early in 14th century, uh, spec uh, specificities had been developed for correcting long-sightedness with convex lenses. These were invented and developed in Northern Italy. By 15, 1451, Nicholas of Cusa, a German philosopher, theologian, theologian and jurist, astronomer had developed the concave lens for nearsightedness. The combination of convex and concave lenses may have been used in simple telescopes by individuals of the time. So the telescopes goes back quite a ways. Earlier, Robert uh, Grosstesk, um, uh, the initiator of the English scientific tradition and one of the first chancellors of Oxford University, wrote a special treatise somewhere between 1230 and 1235 called De Eride concerning the rainbow. In it, he said, quote, these part of optics, when well understood, shows how we make things a very long distance off appear to be placed very close. The large near things appear very small, reversing the scope and how we make we may make uh, small things placed at a distance appear any size we want, so that it may be possible for us to read the smallest letters at incredible distances. So a lot of people say that when it really started had to do with Hans Lippershey, but he didn't come along for a little while. Roger Bacon was a pupil of uh, a pupil of Grotesque at Oxford and often described a magnifying device. It is, however, not certain what he built what he, that he built a working model. Bacon was Bacon was uh, born in England around 1214 to a wealthy family. He studied at Oxford and became a master at Oxford, uh, lecturing on Aristotle. About 1256, he became a Franciscan order friar and then stopped teaching and publishing. His close relationship with uh, the eventual Pope Clemens the, the uh, fourth, his protector, allowed him to write a thesis concerning the place of philosophy within theology. Upon the death of Clo Clem uh, Pope Clement in, 16, in 1268, he was put under security by the church, and between 1277 and 79, he was placed either in a house arrest or imprisoned uh, for excessive uh, credulity uh, in alchemy. Uh, he returned to his studies as a Franciscan and died around 1294. So they had other interests, obviously, going at the same time. And then in 1608, a Dutch oculist named Hans Lippershey, this is the guy, okay, lived from 1570 to 1619, is said to have created the first telescope. These telescopes were made by combining convex, convex objective and concave eyepieces. Lippershey was born in Wessel, Germany. He moved to Middleburg in the Netherlands in 1594, married and became a citizen the same year. He became a, a master lens grinder and spectacle maker and established a business in Middleburg. On October the 2nd, 1608, he applied to the states, um, general, the, the states, to the states uh, general, of the Netherlands for a patent for his instrument um, for seeing things far away as if they were nearby. He was denied the patent uh, since there was there were others who also claimed the invention. It is said he observed a couple of children in the shop looking through the lenses commenting how a nearby weather vane appeared much closer. Others said he took credit for the discovery made by the an apprentice or stole the idea from another person. He was handsomely uh, awarded by the Dutch government for copies of his design called a Dutch perspective lens, a glass. Little is known about the rest of the man's life except that he spent his entire life in Middleburg and died in September of 1619. Uh, there's a, a vignette to this story. Um, one of the issues with getting a patent is in fact, 
We've learned since that he did, in fact, get a patent. And what he did is he went to the government and he said to them, well, here's a really nice thing about the telescope. And the nice thing about the telescope is if somebody is invading us, we can see them out at sea coming at us. So we can either get prepared to fight them or hide whatever you need to do, right? And then he got the patent because they said, oh, it's a military thing. That's how the world works today, I guess, and then as well. Some have said that the telescope was actually created by Zacharias Jansen, also a spec spectacle maker in Middleburg. By the way, you'll see some pictures along the way where I couldn't find the person, so I used one of our members. That's uh, <laughs> going to see this appear apparently. Actually, the interesting thing about it, as I updated, there were some of the pictures I did find, by the way, but uh, you may see some of that in there. Born in The Hague, he was a street seller who was in constant trouble with the authorities. Twice married, he had a son with his first wife. He became a spectacle maker in around 1616, but his best craft was as a counterfeiter. In the years uh, 1613 to 1619, Jansen was tried several times for counterfeiting coins. Jansen grew up right next to the Middleburg Mint where his brother-in-law worked. Jansen uh, learned to mimic the process of manufacturing money. He fled to a village, uh, uh, the, the, up to the village of Armuden, Ar 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 it's Arner Muden. I've always had trouble with that one, to avoid the penalties for counterfeiting coins, but continued counterfeiting coins there. 1619, he was arrested, uh, um, he, he was arrested uh, for owning counterfeiting devices. One could, have, he, one could have been sentenced to death for this crime, but since the father of the town, bailiff, was, was found to be an accessory, the legal process was delayed, allowing Jansen to flee again. After the case was dismissed, Jansen returned to Middleburg uh, in 1621. He remarried after the death of his first wife, and they moved to Amsterdam in 1926. In 1928, he was bankrupt. He did live for a while next door to Lippershey and could have contributed to the telescope's invention, but there is no proof of that. Earlier in 1595, while assisting his father, he was involved with the invention of the single lens optical microscope. Jansen is one of three people who have been associated with the invention of the telescope in the Netherlands in 1608. When Hans Lippershey filed for the patent for the device on October 2nd, a second patent application by a Jacob Medius uh, was filed shortly thereafter. Both were turned down because of the counterclaims of the invention. Varying accounts of, uh, were cited to support Janssen as a possible inventor of the telescope. German astronomer Simon Marius wrote about a meeting he held with an unnamed Dutchman who tried to sell him a, a device that sounded like a telescope in 1608 uh, at the Autumn Frankfurt Fair. Given his, given his uh, history as a street seller, there is speculation that unnamed, the, that unnamed Dutchman would very well have been Zacharias Janssen. Um, if true, Janssen had a telescope at least a month before Lippershey, uh, Lippershey's October 2nd patent date. William de Boro, who visited Middleburg to research the invention in 1655, interviewed Janssen's son, Johannes, Burrell con concluded that Janssen's telescope was probably finished in 1610. There are other claims that Janssen constructed the first telescope in 1604 or even earlier. In fact, Janssen's son testified under oath that Hans Lippershey, Lippershey had stolen his father's invention of the telescope and that he and his grandfather had invented the device in 1599. Quite a complex story. There is documentary evidence that principles of the telescope were known in the late 16th century. Writings of John D. and Thomas Diggs in 1570 and 1571 describe the use of both the refracting and reflecting telescopes to uh, Leonard, Leonard Diggs, uh, the father of Thomas. Independently, he, this report was confirmed by William Bourne in around 1580. Uh, there were no surviving designs nor physical evidence existing and they may have been experimental devices, which of course were not widely reported nor reproduced. Thomas described his father's device as follow. My father 
by his continuous painful, painstaking practices was able by proportional glasses duly situated in convenient angles, not only discovered things far off, red letters, number of pieces of money with a coin, every, every coin subscription thereof, but also in fields seven miles off. It is said that although Diggs may have created a rudimentary instrument involving both lenses and mirrors, the optical performance required to see the details seven miles away was well beyond the Times technology. Leonard Diggs, born in 1515, in Jan January 1554, Diggs took part in an unsuccessful rebellion led by Sir Thomas Wyatt. Diggs was convicted of high treason and condemned to death. He was pardoned on April the 1st, 1554, and in 1555, February, Diggs was fined 400 marks, which he paid off. The date Diggs' death is unknown. He is thought to have died about 1559. Thomas Diggs, born uh, about 1546, was the son of Leonard. After the death of his father, Diggs grew up under the guardianship of John D, a, res a, res a Renaissance natural philosopher. Uh, Diggs served for a time as member of the parliament for Wallingford. Diggs died on the 24th of August, 1595. Thomas Diggs also wrote on astronomy and translated Copernicus into English and pushed the use of experimentation in astronomy. He may have used the telescope to observe the heavens a generation before Galileo. It's a little bit more complex than all of you thought, isn't it, right? Uh, Gambibista del Porta, an Italian scholar and playwright, also claimed to have invented the first telescope, but died while preparing a treatise uh, in support of his claim. His efforts were overshadowed by Galileo Galilei, improvement of the telescope in 1609. In Italy in 1586, Della Porta wrote a letter to make glasses that can recognize a man several miles away. In his Natural Magic, which he published in 1589, he wrote, with a concave lens, you can see small things far off very clearly. With a convex lens, lens, things near to be greater, but more securely. If you know how to fit them together, you can see both things far, uh, far off and things near hand, both greater and clearly. He felt the idea of a telescope unimportant and focused his attention on other things. He was also referred to the professor of secrets. There are similar claims about the Catalan John Root, Rouget, uh, inventing early telescopes devices also. And now we get to the guy. In June of 1609, Galileo, while in Venice, heard of the Dutch pers perspective glass. On his return to Padua, constructed his first telescope by fitting a convex lens at one end of a lead tube and a concave lens on the other end then used his design a few days later to improve on it and make a better telescope than the first. Thus, was most likely the first to apply to astronomy. On his return to Florence, publicized the details of his invention and presented the instrument uh, to, to, to the doge, uh, Leonardo Donato, who was sitting on the Senate Council. The Senate, in return, gave him uh, for his lectureship at Epituda and doubled his salary. His first telescope was of three power, the second one was eight power, and the third one we used to discover the satellites of Jupiter, Jupiter magnified 33 times. With this scope, uh, scope, he observed the spots on the sun, the phases of Venus, and the valleys in, of the moon, uh, and of course, the ears of Saturn. Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, the telescope was not powerful enough to take to make you see a ring. So what he thought he was looking at was two moons in synchronous orbit going around Saturn. And it took until Cassini to resolve the rings many years later. He was honored by, for his invention with a banquet held by his close friend, uh, Prince Federico Sesi, Greek poet, uh, uh, theologian Giona Giovanni uh, Demenciani, who was theologian, chemist, mathematician to Cardinal Cazanza, a mem and member of the Lenzi Academy, inventing the word telescope, telefar, scope in to see and look. 
look or see. Uh, Galileo's history was well documented, although it is important to note the telescope was probably the most contributed to his eventual problems, problems with the church. Um, says, uh, Sessi's demise in 1630 also contributed. Galileo was born in Pisa in 1554. He learned from his father to be skeptical of, of established authority. I must be related to him. Um, and trust the value of quantified experimentation. He was one of the first scientists dedicated to experimentation, and in 1586, he became chair of mathematics at Pisa. From 1692 to 1609, 1592 to 1609, he was professor of geometry, um, mechanics, and astronomy at the University of Padua. As said before in 1610, after learning of the invention of the telescope, he developed his own and studied the planets, moon, and the sun. 1615, he met with uh, Cardinal Bellarmine, chief officer of the Inquisition. The Cardinal insisted that the Pope wanted Galileo to treat the heliocentric theory just as a theory, and Galileo agreed. When Pope Urban ascended to the papacy, being an old friend, uh, Galileo visited him at the Vatican six times and got him to agree to allow him to publish a book discussing heliocentric theory. Uh, but only as a theory. Unfortunately, Prince Sessi um, had passed away in 1630, like I said, when the book was published elsewhere. The Jesuits who didn't like Galileo began with influence uh, Pope Urban to try him, and he spent the, la the rest of his life under house arrest. It's a sad story about that guy, but uh, again, no surprise. Uh, these are, are, are on top of each other because generally this thing brings things in and I can't get it to do it right now. So um, bear with me, most of it will be explained. Johannes Kepler described how a telescope should be made in 1611. In his publication called Catoptrix, he was the first to explain the theory and practical advantages of the telescope constructed of two convex lenses. Jesuit uh, Christopher Shiner was actually the first who constructed the telescope in this form. Uh, he turned out to be Galileo's chief antagonist at the, at, its, at the trial. Later, Christian Huygens and Johannes uh, Hevelius based their telescope on his design. I will not detail uh, Kepler's life since it is, it, I've given a full presentation about him at another time. Um, well, probably uh, revisit Ms. Mr. Kepler in the future with a updated presentation as well. Christian Huygens in 1655, uh, telescopes were being built on Kepler's design. These telescopes were pow powerful, but extremely unwieldy. And although Christian Huygens was able to resolve for the first time the rings of Saturn, by the way, it was him, not Cassini. He was, a, he was close with Cassini. It was difficult to use. Kind of, um, of uh, spectacular to look at, impossible to look through, they always said. Uh, he employed compound lenses as, as eyepieces for the first time. Christian Huygens was born in the, a in the, at The Hague in the Netherlands in 1629 to a very influential family. Taught by private tutors, secured by his wealthy father, he was exposed early to the French uh, philosopher and mathematician Rene Descartes. He studied law and mathematics at the University of Leiden in the College of Orange. In 1663, he was elected to the Royal Society and was a contemporary of Sir Isaac Newton. Though he respected Newton, he oftentimes disagreed with him, as did many. Um, in 1654, he shifted his attention from mathematics to astronomy. He developed a more effective method of grinding and polishing lenses, which provided for greater clarity. He was involved in the study of light and its properties and was the first to produce that light travels in waves and was instrumental in calculating the laws of reflection and refraction. Newton rejected the theory and favored explanation that light was composed of several small bodies moving. To lay light is understood to, be, to have both attributes of waves and particles, obviously. Pre, prior to his death in 1695, he wrote a book, Cosmotheris, which speculated on extraterrestrial life. Uh, the first powerful telescopes developed with Kepler's construction were made by Huygens and his brother, 
with a 2.24 inch objective and a 12 foot long focal length. It was this, it was th with this new adapted telescope that he discovered the rings of Saturn and the Saturn's moon Titan. Telescopes made of Kepler's design were limited in their sharpness and chromatic aberration. The only matter in which the aberration could be solved for high magnifying powers was to create objectives with very long focal lengths. Giovanni Cassini discovered Saturn's fifth satellite, Rhea, in 1672 with a telescope that was 35 feet in length. The aerial telescope was developed because of the difficulties with focal length. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Around the same time, Johannes Hevelius had built a 150-foot behemoth, which Edmund Halley, Halley described as just barely useful. Besides having really long tubes, these telescopes needed scaffolding or long mast and cranes to support them. As a research tool, it was virtually useless in that the tube flexed and vibrated and sometimes collapsed. Um, Hevelius was born in 1611 to a wealthy family. He discovered, studied jurisprudence at Leiden. Upon the death of his father, he took over the family business brewery, but by 1641, he was set up, he had set up an observatory on the roof of his home. At the time, it was the largest observatory in Europe. He built high quality lenses uh, with which he studied the topography of the sun, the moon, and the planets. He made detailed studies of the moon's surface, phases, and librations. He married twice, he got help in running the brewery with each of his wife, from each of his wives. Um, his second wife, Elizabeth, published two of his works posthumously and is considered the first female astronomer of note. Interestingly enough, Hevelius decided not to employ telescopic lenses on his sextant, which had uh, to, made much this chagrin of other astronomers of the time, particularly with, uh, with British astronomer Royal John Flemspeed, um, who discredited nearly everything Hevelius produced. Hevelius spent a lot of time as a municipal administrator while manufacturing his observatory. His observatory instruments and books were destroyed in a fire in 1679, and he died of a stroke in 1687. And after 1675, the telescope tube was discarded completely. Thus, the aerial te telescope came into being. The objective was mounted on a swiveling ball joint on the top of a pole or a tree and other tall structure and aimed by, mean, me, uh, by means of a string or connecting rod. The eyepiece was handheld or mounted on a stand at the focus of it in the image, was found by trial and error. Some of this is hilarious to me. Christian Huygens and his brother were credited with the development of the telescope, although who invented it is unknown. The brothers Huygens made objectives as large as 8.5 inches with a 210 foot focal length. Andrea Oshout made telescopes with focal lengths as large as 600 feet. Difficult to employ, Cassini had, did discover two Saturn satellites in 1684, Rhea and Enceladus, with an aerial telescope 136 feet in length. Uh, I gave uh, uh, a um, uh, presentation on both Cassini and, uh, and Huygens uh, for your edification at some point in time, again. Uh, the history of the curved mirror used to form the image probably goes back to the time of Greek scientist Euclid. There is no question that it was studied intensively by Al Hazen, um, in the 11th century. His main work, uh, called the Book of Optics, being known mainly through a 13th century commentary by Kamal al-Din al-Farisi, with a Latin translation uh, was produced later uh, in the 13th century. Giovanni uh, Francisco Segreto, along with his best friend Galileo, 
and others discuss building telescopes using a mirror as the image forming the objective. Um, by the way, Scredo was honored by Galileo by using his name for one of his characters in the great manuscript dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. Okay, now we've got Niccolo Zucchini. Study rhetoric in Placenza and philosophy and theology in Parma. He finished his studies at the age of 16, entered the Jesuit order in Padua in 1602, where he remained for the rest of his life. Zucchi was a professor at the Collegio Romano and a rector of the Jesuit College in Ravenna. He served as an apostolic preacher, a post often referred to as preacher to the Pope. He received patronage from the Duke of Parma and authorized several books on optics. Another close friend of Galileo, he wrote that he had tried to replace the lens of a refracting telescope with a bronze concave mirror in 1616. Using a handheld concave lens, he looked into the mirror but could not get a satisfactory image. So he shortly abandoned his effort and, uh, and passed away in 1670. Suki's failure illustrates the major problem in the construction of relative, relative, uh, reflecting telescopes. Mistakes in the curvature or surface of the mirror distort the image and to a point of uselessness with a factor of six greater than similar errors with polishing of lenses. Around 1640, uh, Marin Merceni also published several designs for reflecting telescopes, but never tried to build one, probably because he was aware of the technical problems involved. Marcin, a French theologian and mathematician, was best remembered by mathematicians for his search for a formula to generate prime numbers, now known as the Marcin numbers. From 1614 to 1618, he taught philosophy and theology at Nevers. He traveled often, but resided in Paris from 1619 until his death in 1648. The history of the reflecting telescope claiming one individual as, an, uh, as the inventor is problematic. One first has to decide if the originator concept or the producer of the first working model is actually to be considered an inventor. or the inventor rather. The earliest known presentation of the optical prism of reflecting telescopes to be found in the works of the first century Alexandrian mathematician, engineer, and inventor, Hero. He demonstrated that a conclave parabolic mirror focuses parallel rays reflecting, reflected from its surface at the point, creating an image. The telescopic property of mirrors, uh, of parabolic mirrors, as well as as it was well known to Leonardo da Vinci, who discussed it in one of his unpublished manuscripts. A lot of people got involved, as you can see, right? Lots of people. The first form of reflecting telescope was invented by James Gregory, a Scottish mathematician and astronomer. He, James was born in Drumoek, Aberdeenshire, and was initially educated at home by his mother. After his father's death in 1651, his elder brother, David, took over the responsibility for his education. He was uh, educated at Marischal College, graduating in 1657, and in 1664, he continued his education at the University of Padua. Returning to London in 1668, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. He then traveled to St. Andrews in late 1668 to become the first uh, Regius Professor of Mathematics. He was professor at the University of St. Andrews and also at the University of Edinburgh. Um, uh, about a year after assuming the chair of mathematics at Edinburgh, Gregory suffered a stroke while viewing the moons of Jupiter with his students. He died a few days later and was only 37. In other words, by the time James Gregory attained uh, our age, he was dead for 36 years. As I should <laughs> okay, I don't know why I added that, but it's been a while since I did it. All right. Ah, in 1668, here he comes. Isaac Newton built the first practical reflector. And, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't do this, but at our next meeting, I'm going to bring both a, a, a 
copy of both Galileo's and Isaac Newton's telescope. We'll bring it next meeting. So make sure you come to our next meeting. How's that for selling? Huh? Like that? Okay. Uh, this was the second form of reflecting telescope. The design incorporated a small flat diagonal mirror, which reflected light to an eyepiece mounted on the side of the telescope. The history of, of Newton is well known. Perhaps the greatest physicist of all time is, uh, is uh, Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathemat uh, Mathematica was first published in 1687, laid the foundations for classical mechanics. He also shared credit with Di Gottfried Leibniz for the development of calculus. He was also known for his inability to get along with other scientists and theologians and for delving into alchemy. That's false chemistry, by the way, in case you didn't know that, all right? Anyway, but, but his list of accomplishments are staggering. He was a fellow of Trinity College, second Lucasian uh, professor of, of mathematics at the University of Cambridge. He was president of the Royal Society and the master of the Royal Mint. Uh, it is a mark of Newton's abilities as a technician and craftsman that he succeeded in constructing and polishing a functioning mirror. I will tell you one thing that is, is really important here. Um, Newton didn't get along with anybody except for one person, Edmund Halley. He got along with Halley, and Halley got him to come out of his shell, if you want to call that. Very interesting fellow as well. Lauren Cassegrain described the design of the reflector with a small convex secondary mirror to reflecting light through a central hole in the main mirror. Laurent Cassegrain was a Catholic priest who was notable as the probable inventor of the Cassegrain reflector. Uh, it's the third form of reflecting telescope, a folded two mirror reflecting telescope design. Laurent Cassegrain was born in France in 1629. His education was not known was uh, not is not known was, but he was a priest and professor in in uh, by 1654. At the time of death, he was working as a teacher, giving science classes to high schools. He died in Taldron in 1693. Cassegrain reflect re reflector is a reflecting telescope design that solved the problem of viewing an image without obstructing the primary mirror by using a convex secondary mirror on the optical axis to bounce the light back through a hole in the primary mirror, thus preventing the light to reach the eyepiece. The eyepiece. At first, it first appeared in the eighth edition of the 17th French century, uh, French science journal, Rissoul de Memories, uh, published by Jean-Baptiste Denis in uh, 1672. There he is, John Hadley. This really wasn't much further development in the reflecting telescope. There, was, there actually wasn't much done with the reflecting telescope for the next 50 years or so. John Hadley, the inventor of the octant cursor to the sectant, developed a way to make precision a spheric and parabolic uh, uh, speculum metal mirrors. John Hadley was born in London in 1717 and became a member um, and later vice president of the Royal Society of London. In 1722, he presented the Royal Society the first parabolic Newtonian reflector. It was a six inch diameter uh, speculum uh, metal objective mirror with a focal length of 62 and three quarter inches. It was comparable in the performance with the 7.5 inch aerial telescope developed by the brothers Huygens. Hadley died in East Barnett in 1770, 1744. James Bradley and Samuel Molyneux used Hadley's procedure to develop a large reflecting telescope with focal lengths of eight feet or more. Two London opticians, Scarlett and Hearn, started a business of manufacturing these type of telescopes. Bradley was born in uh, Sherborne, England. He was educated at uh, Balliol College in Oxford, receiving both the BA and the MA. His early observations made the rectory of Wernstadt in Essex under the tutelage of Reverend James Pound. Um, his uncle and skilled astronomer, his uncle and skilled astronomy Bradley, was elected 
to, as a fellow to the Royal Society in late 1718 and appointed Astronomer Royal in 1742, succeeding Edmund Halley. Uh, he is best known for his fundamental discoveries in, in astronomy, the aberration of light, and the nutation of the Earth's ad, ad axis. Bradley retired uh, in broken health and died in 1762. Uh, Samuel Molyneux was born in Chester, England, and died in Kiev. He was the son of William Molyneux, all, who was known for his work related to optics. He earned his Bachelor of Arts and Master at Trinity College and was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1712 and served as a member of the Parliament and as Lord of the Admiralty. Uh, in 1730, Scottish mathematician and optician James Short uh, revisited the Gregory design using parabolic and elliptic uh, figures with the use of speculum metal mirrors. He built a business in building telescopes of this type. And at the time of his death in 1768, he had amassed a considerable fortune from the sale of telescopes. Uh, in, born in um, 1710, uh, uh, Maclurian, professor of mathematics at the University of Edinburgh, gave him permission to use rooms in the college buildings for experiments in the, construct, in the construction of telescopes. 1730 said he was elected fellow of the Royal Society, and in 1758, a foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Um, he had a considerable fortune, as said. Uh, Mikhail Lomonosov. Of the of one of the greatest issues with the abilities of reflector telescopes encountered in the early going was the fact that speculum metal mirror secondaries and diagonal mirrors greatly reduced the light reflected to the Y pieces. Several telescope designers attempted to do away with them. Uh, Mikhail developed a telescope with its primary mirror, uh, mirror tilted at four degrees to the telescope's axis so the image could be viewed via an eyepiece mounted at the front of the telescope. He presented this telescope to the Russian Academy of Science in 1762. His innovation was not published until 1827. At this time, the great astronomer William Herschel had also developed a telescope with this design and thus called it the Herschelian uh, uh, Telescope, where in fact it was probably should have been named after Lemesov. Uh, he was born in, uh, in Russia, North Russia. Early on, he had an insatiable appetite for education gained admitted into the Slavic Greek Latin Academy by claiming to be the son of a priest. He learned German while at the University of, of, Mar of Marburg, uh, studied philosophy, chemistry, and even wrote poetry. He taught physics, chemistry, geology, geography, and dabbled in optics. Uh, the gold medal in his name was established in 1959 and awarded annually uh, to the Russian Academy of Sciences. Which brings us to the great William Herschel. He gave a complete presentation of the Herschel. I gave a complete presentation of the Herschel family. It's one of the ones I had the most fun putting together, but we'll, uh, but we'll uh, kind of review the highlights of his life after the information about the telescopes completed. He was by trade initially a teacher of music. Every spent much of his spare time with the construction of reflector telescope mirrors. He began his work with telescopes in 1774 and gave up teaching music to dedicate the rest of his life to the construction of his telescopes and also astronomical research. By 1778, using a six and a quarter inch reflector mirror, he built a seven foot local focal length telescope. With this telescope, he made his early astronomical discoveries, including 1781, the discovery of the planet Uranus, called the Georgian Star of King George. Uh, this discovery earned him uh, the Copley Medal, and he was elected to the Royal Society. Uh, Her uh, Herschel uh, discovered uh, Uranus moons, Oberon and Titania, uh, on January the 11th, 1787, with, his, with the 18-inch, eight 18-inch, 20-foot local-length telescope he built in 1783. He used the scope for the next 20 years, replacing the mirror several times. In 1789, Herschel finished construction of the largest reflecting telescope of the time, 
with a mirror of 49 inches and a focal length of 40 feet. It's located at his home in Slow, England. The innovations he made to his telescope included uh, eliminating the small diagonal mirror with his design and tilting his primary mirror so that he could view the formed image directly, thus eliminating the poor reflectability of spectrum mirrors. Thus, the original inventor of uh, 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 Lormonosov became the Herschelian telescope, like we talked about. Um, with this scope, he discovered the first light on uh, at first light on uh, in 1789 in August, Saturnian moon Enceladus or Enceladus, if you like. And 20 days later, he discovered Mimas. This was the largest telescope in existence for the next 50 years but was difficult to handle. So he favored using his 18.7 inch reflector for much of his work. Although he developed 400 telescope mirrors, most of his work was done with the three telescopes mentioned. He was born in Hanover, Germany, 1738. He and his father were renowned musicians, he played the oboe, organ, harposcope. He composed 24 symphonies and many concertos. He was the first violin and uh, he was the first violin and solace uh, for the Newcastle Orchestra. He was inspired to move to astronomy by his friend Neva Maskelyne, and then English astronomer and then the then English Royal uh, English astronomer Royal. He is best known for creating a catalog along with his sister Caroline, which has surpassed surpassed by a substantial margin the number of objects that the Messier's catalog had in it. By the way, Messier stopped naming those objects because there were 110, is that right? Is that the number? 110 Messier objects? Uh, the Herschels discovered 2,000 objects and, uh, and Messier just went, okay, <laughs> enough. All right. Um, he was also involved in the development of a spectroscopic studies he was the father of John Herschel, who was also a great astronomer of the time in his own right. John Herschel went south of the equator to establish a uh, observatory down there. And that is our really first uh, chance to see the Southern Hemisphere stars, by the way, just as a side note. There's a lot of side notes. All right, in 1845, William Parsons, the uh, the third Oral of Ross built a 72 inch Newtonian reflector called the Le Leviathan of Parsontown. With this telescope, he discovered the several form of galaxies. But spiral. what? Spiral. Spiral. I, did I say that? I'm sorry. Sometimes I could put it together. But like all very large telescopes, he suffered from, from poor reflectability and fast tarnishing uh, of their spectrum metal mirrors and had to be frequently removed and repolished. Thank you very much for that, by the way. Okay, back to the uh, refractor. Earlier in the, uh, the achromatic lens appeared in 1729 and, or 1733 made by Chester Moore Hall, uh, revolutionary refractor telescopes. The lenses, uh, this lens greatly reduced chromatic aberration, that's color distortion in objective lenses and allowed for a much shorter and much more functional telescope. Mr. Hall did not publish the information. Uh, Hall was born in Essex, England. He was a British lawyer and an inventor. Hall never took, really took control of his creation. The man of independent means merely communicated his invention to the world. He probably would have made a fortune or could have made a fortune developing this idea, but, he, the, but when he applied for patent, there was an arduous trial in Westminster Hall with Hall on one side and DeLon on another. Lord Mansfield decided that although he had invented the achromatic telescope, he ruled it was not the original inventor who ought uh, to profit from such invention, but the one who brought for it forth for the benefit of mankind. To wit, Tolland continued to be a successful lawyer for the rest of life and really never showed very much care for astronomy after that. John Dolland. Dolland obtained the information he made, uh, a very large business by producing telescopes of this design, selling them commercially in 1658. He 
He was a well-known British optician and best known for production of the achromatic doublet, which he patented and commercialized. Dolland at the first, at first uh, followed his father's trade of silk weaving. He acquired knowledge in Latin, Greek, mathematics, physics, anatomy, and many other subjects. He left the silk weaving trade and along with his brother, Peter started a business making optical instruments. The business uh, still exists as Dolland uh, Aitchison. Uh, he and his son made a fortune and in 1761, shortly before his passing, he was appointed optician to the king. Early in 1575, 1757, he succeeded in producing ref refraction without color of the use of water lenses and shortly thereafter successfully utilized glass for the same result. In 1758, he was awarded the Copley Medal, medal by the Royal Society, became a fellow of the Society at the time. 1747, uh, Leonard, uh, uh, Leonard uh, Euler produced a paper which he sent to the Prussian uh, Academy of Sciences attempting to prove the possibility of correcting both the chromatic and spherical aberration of a lens. He adopted a hypothetical law of the dispersion and uh, proved uh, analytically poss possibly of construction an achromatic objective composed of lenses of glass and water. He was able to produce the actual objective construction. Dollars uh, stated that Euler's analysis was accurate, but was purely a theoretical assumption. He believed Euler's theory was opposed to the re results of Isaac Newton's experiments on the reflection of life. Dolan received an abstract of the Euler paper from Swedish mathematician and astronomer <coughs> Samuel uh, Klingersterner, which put some doubt in his mind as to the accuracy of Newton's work on dispersion of reflected light. Dahlin experimented and, and confirmed uh, Klingensterna's conclusions and constructed lenses in which first the chromatic aberration and afterward the spherical aberration was corrected. I said before, Dahlin and his family yielded a great fortune. And uh, he, uh, Peter Dollar in 1765 introduced a triple objective which consisted of the combination of two convex lenses of crown glass and concave flint lens between them. Uh, he made many telescopes of this time. And there's a whole bunch of people. The problem with the refractors, which continued through the late 1700s and through 1800s, was the difficulty in finding discs of glass, particularly flint glass, that was suitable purity and homogeneity. Uh, he, this limited the diameter of the light gathering power of lenses found in the achromatic telescope. The French Academy of Science offered large prizes to perfect discs of optical plinth glass, but to no avail. Ongoing problems with building reflect, refracting, uh, reflecting telescopes still made the refractor the telescope of choice. Reflectors were played with impacted metal mirrors and constant need to pull them out of telescopes for periodic polishing. This refracting telescope be, uh, were being produced and even larger apertures. Um, and in 16, 1866, the refracting telescope of 18 inches wide was for the short term, the big daddy. But it was the 19th century came to a close. There was a numerous great refractors, the two largest 36 inch Lick Observatory and the 40 inch Yerkes were built. Both tested the limits of practical research because of the <coughs> effect of gravity on the lens itself. Understanding if you get a lens that's big enough, gravity can can warp it. Um, uh, there, uh, uh, let's go on. Lenses can only be held in place by the their edge, which causes the center of it to sag due to, like I said, gravity. This distorted images produces. This was a there was a nine. 49.2 inch refractor exhibited at the Great Paris Exhibition in 1900, which was never put to use. The 40 inch telescope developed by the University of Chicago in George Ellery Hale um, and placed at Williams Bay, Wisconsin. Funding for this telescope was obtained by the Charles T. Yerkes railway magnet and this, this repair, uh, repairable renown who wanted to have his name affixed to the world's largest telescope. Although he funded the telescope, he was very tight with funds 
for support equipment, which to the chagrin of Hale and the University, uh, much to the chagrin of Uni Hale and the University of Chicago, telescopes saw new light, first light in 1697, and is sometimes called the birthplace of modern astrophysics. It was reduced over 170,000 photographic plates and many notable astronomy work within its walls, including Edwin Hubble, um, Tesk, yeah, I, I know we're gonna, we're gonna do it. Yes, I get it. Um, I, again, th th what we're gonna do, and, and I did this the last time when I did the presentation, was we separated into two presentations. And what we'll do is we'll finish the eight minutes of it here, and at some point in the near future, we'll go in further. And by that time, we'll probably have several more telescopes to discuss, obviously. So I just want you to know that I'm going eight more minutes and then we'll get into the crux of the 1900s, which changed a whole lot of things, all right? Certainly with space travel and such. All right, uh, the first, uh, there were 170,000, um, uh, what did I do there? Oh, there we go, okay. There were 170,000 photographic plates. Uh, the, the people that worked on it was Hubble and Chandras, uh, Chandras Kar, uh, 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 Subra, um, Mannion. Uh, Edwin Emerson Bar Barnard, I got a great presentation on him, Otto Struve, and more recently Carl Sagan. Uh, the scope was built by Alvin Clark and Sons, and they are, their company is still in effect and still working with that. All right. Um, the builder of the great refractors of the late 1800s and early 1900s was the Warner and Swazi Company. Uh, they built the 36-inch Lick telescope, the 40-inch Yerkes telescope, and the 26-inch telescope at the U.S. Naval Observatory. The company was founded in 1880 as a, as a partnership of Worcester Reed Warner, 1846 to 18, 1929, and Ambrose Swayze, uh, 1846 to 1937. The company was operated uh, from its forming till its acquisition in 1980. Warner was a scientist, manufacturer of equipment, and a philanthropist, close friend and next door neighbor to John D. Rockefeller. He, of course, was the, uh, was one of the co-founders of uh, Warner and Swayze, initially to manage tool and precision instruments company in first Chicago, then Cleveland. He also made astronomical telescopes for the government. He was president of the American Society of Mechanical Engineering and a fellow of the Royal Astronom Astronomers Society of Great Britain, and socially awarded. Uh, annually awards at Worcester Reed Medal, uh, Warner Medal for outstanding contribution to permanent lit 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 literature of engineering. He passed away in 1929. Shown here are three major telescopes built by Warner and Swayze. The Lick Telescope, used by E.E. E. Barnard, who discovered the fifth moon of uh, Jupiter, Almathea. Uh, it was the first moon of Jupiter to be discovered since Galileo. Uh, all optics in these telescopes were produced by Alvin Clark and Sons. And uh, Alvin Clark, uh, born in Asheville, Massachusetts, the descendant of, the, of a Cape Cod whaling family of English ancestry, was the American astronomer of telescope maker. He was a portrait painter and an engraver. Um, uh, at the age of 40, became involved in telescope making using glass blanks as firm Alvin Clark and Sons ground lenses for reflecting refracting telescopes, including the largest of the time, of course. Um, uh, the 18.5 inch uh, at Dearborn Observatory in Old University of Chicago, also the 226 inch telescopes of the United States Naval Observatory, the McCormick Telescope, and on and on. He and his son uh, was George, his other son was George Bessett Clark, both sons, were partners in the front the firm. Uh, Al, son Alvin uh, was uh, born in Massachusetts on April January the 1862. Uh, while testing the new 18-inch telescope, he made the first observation of Sirius B at in Camelport, Massachusetts. Uh, be, between the scope was moved to Evanston. The magnitude eight uh, eight uh, companion of Sirius is also known. Uh, first known white dwarf star. The 18 and a half inch reflecting is now being used at Lambert Dearborn University uh, of, Nor of Northwestern University in Evanston. Uh, Bassett was born in Lowell, Massachusetts. 
And we need to stop here to discuss the most important individual development to the, to the development of the modern telescope. And this will be the last thing we'll discuss. Long, um, George Eric Hale was, was a spectacular astronomer, uh, a good individual as well, but he was very highly respected by nearly everybody uh, who ever met him. He was a class act. Um, he was a dynamo. His, he was instrumental in getting the largest telescopes of the late 19th and 20th century, uh, late 19th and the 20th century financed and built. He had already discussed his work with Yerkes. Um, he was also the center of development for the 36 inch Lick telescope as well. He also developed the 60 inch Mount Wilson Observatory Hale Telescope in 1908 and the 100 inch Mount Wilson Hooker Telescope in 1917. He also developed the two solar telescopes building uh, on a theory that because of the heat generated by the earth, they needed to be elevated. He built a 60 foot solar telescope and a 150 foot other solar telescope. Uh, these scopes were specifically used to obviously for observing the sun. He was a key figure in development of the Mount Palomar 200 inch telescope, which saw first light in um, 1947 after Hale had passed away. Um, uh, you, you have uh, through time, all of these individuals, like I said, I've gone through 76, uh, 36 pages uh, of this already, and it's about 70. So I, w I just wanted you to know that I enjoyed this for you tonight. We will get into the other telescopes that came in, such as the Hubble, such as the uh, Kepler, such as um, the James Webb, obviously. And uh, if you have any questions, now is the time to do it, but we don't have much time. Thank you. Any questions at all? Hey, what's this talk about this uh, new Euclid telescope that's out there? That's uh, remind me on the I just I, I heard it on Twitter. I don't remember a lot about it either. There's this new telescope out, Euclid, it's supposed to be mapping a lot of the galaxy. Yeah, and it, um, it's also on, on one of the satellites, as I recall. I believe so. Yeah, yeah. right. Yes, yeah, that there's new information going in, and by the next presentation we'll hear that. Yeah, yeah. you're I'm interested, interested in it, yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions that you have? Telescope making has been very complex, and there's been a lot of personalities and a lot of egos, either first or kept, because of it. Understand that we're constantly looking, we're constantly doing. The James Webb is spectacular. That's the thing that I have a picture of the Hubble shot of the photo of the creation, and one by the James Webb. I don't know if you've seen, probably seen it. It's a stunning how you can see it. Will be discovered thus in all the telescopes of great interest as time goes along. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Ken. All right, our next meeting is in person at Cranbrook Institute of Science on Monday, September 11th, not September 4th. That's Labor Day. And we are going to. What? That is correct. Okay. And uh, we're meeting afterwards here at the National Coney Island on Grosbeck, just south of 12 Mile. Uh, thank you for coming. Enjoy your evening. Good night. Good. Thank you very All much right. for the use of that. No problem. Next time I will have this geared so that I do the way I want to do it. But that was good. For okay. second monitor. All right. oh, let me get this. So what I did is I stopped. Yes. Are the, um, the solar stones, are those the one in McMath or is there different ones? The ones hailed